I would like to open my file and I hope uh, you can see my file. Well, can you see my PowerPoints? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. So uh, as I was introduced, uh, I'm a professor emeritus of Keio University and I was a former Dean and CEO of Asian Development Bank Institute. Today, I would like to talk about uh, four points and how uh, fintech industries affect the households, firms, and financial institutions. And then next, I'm going to talk about uh, big data analysis for SME lending. And thirdly, uh, fintech will affect the household debt overhang. And then lastly, I would like to touch upon financial education, what we are doing in Japan. So those are the four points uh, I would like to discuss today. First one, uh, this is a forthcoming paper to financial review at the Ministry of Finance of Japan. How FinTech will affect to households behavior, especially focusing on financial sector. And then I think of, uh, households become much easier to access to various financing methods. And also households can uh, write down lots of uh, checks and a credit card. So it's, it's, they become very easy to borrow money and also lots of uh, ways to finance the assets. So I think financial educations are very important in both sides, borrowing side and asset management side. Secondly, uh, impact to financial sector. Traditionally, Asia was dominated by banking industry, but fintech industries will start transaction services and asset management may be handled by financial uh, fintech industries. Then the role of banks will become smaller. And also startup businesses, they need money. Traditionally, startup businesses are very difficult to borrow money because of risks. However, the development of fintech and big data analysis will allow us to lend money to those sectors. Lastly, I think financial transactions between domestic and overseas market will become much easy. People can use mobile phone and they can purchase overseas products. Then risks they are facing directly. That is why financial education is very important in many people. Lastly, financial stability and deposit insurance. After the development of the FinTech, I think it is very important to differentiate two group of financial products. One is guaranteed products. Those are deposits and uh, uh, deposit guarantee. And then riskier products, which, which has no guarantee by the government. So I think the people has to wear uh, risks and returns and also the safety and rate of return. Mm -hmm. Then next, I would like to talk about big data analysis will become possible by the development of FinTech industry especially SME, small and medium-sized enterprises. SMEs are often told they are difficult to borrow money because of lack of data. So SME in many countries, this is a survey to people in China, India, Korea, and Malaysia. SMEs has three common characters. They have to provide collateral when they want to borrow money. And their interest rate they have to pay to the bank is higher than large companies. And decision procedure of loans takes longer. But SME needs money And they can wait one month, three months. So we need some kind of uh, easy way to be risky SME and so on. So I think that is why the big data analysis will be very important. And this is the example of Japanese CRD, Credit Risk Database. It started about 20 years ago. And in Japan, we have huge amount of SMEs and that is common to many Asian countries. And how do we collect honest data from SME? SME has often a very fake and unreliable database. So we have to find out a way to collect honest and accurate data from SMEs. So we used Credit Guarantee Corporation, 
to collect SME database. Credit Guarantee Corporation provide guarantee for private banks to make loans to SME. So when they SME apply to this credit guarantee, then Credit Guarantee Corporation asks SME, you have to submit your accurate and honest data. And if the data is outlier, then they will never put their guarantee to those SMEs. And if the data becomes huge, then we often have normal distribution and we can identify one noodle shop to another, one bakery, small businesses, and we can look at their performance and also characteristics. So the big data analysis is important and how to make SME to disclose their honest and accurate data. That is also another important. And Japan used Credit Guarantee Corporation. And in Japan, about 60% of SMEs are using Credit Guarantee Corporation to borrow money. So the huge data set has been accumulated. And next, uh, these are the data set that we have been collected. Um, and this is very small. So we have both uh, financial account and uh, um, profit and loss statement and also stock account and so on. Then these are the 10 groups of SME, if you can see here. Then if the risk credit rating of these databases is one or two, they are very good uh, SMEs. And nine or 10 are riskier SME. Then you can see the default risk ratio in nine and 10 becomes very high compared to one and two and three. So this data set will give us very accurate prediction of the default of SME. And that makes banks easier to lend money. So that is created by CRD, Credit Risk Database. And similar analysis can be applied to other data. And this is from Thailand we collected 11 data, uh, combination of data, and there's a national credit bureau in Thailand. And then I have collected the data, and first I applied factor analysis. Then we came up with four important variables to identify one SME to another. One is assets and liquidity, liabilities, and also their sales, and so on. So those are the four important Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4 are the components it came from the factor analysis. Then we propagated the dot data. Then we have found right hand side on the right is a very safe SME. Left hand side, a very risky SME. So even in Thailand SME database, we can identify safe and risky and in between. Then each year we can identify some of the riskier companies becomes in the middle. The middle group, some companies go into right group. Then banks become much easier to lend money to them. So I think the big data analysis is very important by the development of FinTech and uh, financial analysis. Next one is how to provide money to startup businesses. Startup businesses are different from existing SMEs. They don't have any data. Then we cannot apply big data analysis to start a business. So we have to have different approach to start a businesses. And about 20 years ago, Japan started hometown crowdfunding, hometown investment trust funds. The method has been uh, applied to Cambodia, Vietnam, Peru, and Mongolia. The method is, there are two methods. One is internet company will introduce startup products of the companies, farmers, innovators, so they advertise those products through internet. Then consumers can order those products through internet. And if the products are very good, continuously custom, customers come in. And if the products are bad, they cannot sell anymore. So internet use by FinTech, then they are under financial FSA's registration. So FSA is watching this internet company whether proper products will be advertised to consumers. Then startup businesses can easy access to consumers. So if their products are very good, then they can keep on selling their products and their company will grow. 
and these are the related examples uh, farmers can sell their products, fishermen, and these are Japanese sake, wine, and so on. All the uh, products came from innovators, and they can keep on selling very good products. Another one is the investment type of uh, hometown crowdfunding. Left hand side is Cambodian lady who wants to start a small shop. Right hand side is 40 Vietnamese ladies who wants to start their business. And then crowdfunding collected by individuals contribute their money to these uh, startup businesses. And in Asia, we found out female startups are much more reliable compared to men. So I think in many Asian countries, female startups succeeded, but not so much in men. Then next, I'd like to uh, uh, talk about uh, financial education in Japan. So as a development of the FinTech, we, I think it's very important to learn much more financial products including those hometown crowdfunding and also foreign products and exchange refractions. There are so much variety of items uh, consumers has to face with. But uh, school education of finan uh, finance is very lacking in many countries in Asia. If you look at the textbook in primary school, secondary school, high school, you can see only very few pages of the explanation of uh, finance or fintech and so on. So financial education is lacking greatly in many Asian countries. Teachers are aware we need it, but teachers cannot teach because they don't know any products except for deposits. So they cannot teach how stocks are moving and so on. So I think Japan has started a video lecture to children, primary school and another lecture to secondary school, high school. Then the teachers do not have to teach at the class. So video lecture is provided to the students. So that would be very good. So the best teacher can teach to nationwide students and teachers and students can listen to those lectures at the classroom. So how to teach various contents to students is also important in many countries. Then financial education. We have started the Financial Education Promotion Council. It consists of FSA, financial service agencies, Bank of Japan, and also various uh, you know, financial groups. So, and we meet once every quarter. I'm a chairperson of this Financial Education Promotion Council. So <clears throat> this kind of group and nationwide uh, initiative for the financial education will be very important. Okay, next, sorry. Uh, okay, so we set it up a lot of uh, uh, various curriculums. So what kind of items should be taught in primary school, secondary school, high school, and university? So we set up all the items for each grade of the school. So those are the programs in matrices we created. And then uh, we, Japan used to have a big uh, household debt and then a debt overhang. But after financial education is introduced, you can see the debt overhang has been started to decline. So financial education is very important for households, not only asset management, but also borrowing from uh, money lenders, pawn shops, and so on. And left hand side is, I think, Korean case, uh, household debt is increasing. Right hand side, US uh, housing loan, household debt after the burst of the bubble of Lehman shock. And I think household debt has been diminishing. Then we came up the criteria, uh, equations, how to avoid household debt. One is borrowing divided by income ratio. Second one is uh, interest rate seating and so on. So we set it up the criteria so that the people will not go into debt overhang. Then loan divided by income ratio in Japan, we set it up lower than one third. That, and ceiling interest rate, we set it up 20%. So no, no, no one can charge more than 20% in Japan. And this is a case of India. Last law shows loan to income ratio. And then first line is a number of years for borrowing. So then in India case, probably loan divided by income, maybe about one, that could be possible. 
but beyond that, people will go into bankrupt. So I think that uh, uh, debt overhang is a very big problem in Thailand and Korea and many other countries. So I think financial education and also the rules should be important. Lastly, I'd like to talk about financial education and also its performance in financial market. Uh, which in Japan, we have conducted 25,000 survey to all over Japan. And based on that survey, how financial education is affecting people's behavior. So we have 47 states, 47 prefectures. Then we have shown the scores of various questions. And then it, you can find out some uh, prefecture, some states are very low square and others are very high. So this kind of uh, newspaper uh, news is very good for those whose points are very low and they become very serious. We have to teach students much more. So I think that between among states, there are some competition, we should promote our financial education. So this kind of, uh, I think, comparison on nationwide will help to promote financial education. Then financial literacy score, uh, we looked at 25,000 uh, results. Then those who had financial education had higher literacy scores, and that became very significant. So in other words, financial education is very important to understand uh, those uh, financial uh, products and financial assets. And lastly, I think asset allocation is very important for individuals and not only deposits, but also stocks, bonds, overseas products and various products. So portfolio diversifications are important. And this result shows those who had better financial education uh, distributing their income into various financial assets rather than putting their money in one asset. So these results shows, I think in Japan, financial education has a very good performance, but from region by region in Japan, the scores are different. So I think uh, it is very important to keep on continuing financial education. And also we have uh, set it up all the details, what kind of things should be taught in primary school and then secondary school, high school. So this kind of a program will also be important to promote financial education. And uh, that's all my presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Yoshino. Thank you for your very detailed description of uh, the very important topic that is the household financial things and also the uh, education in financial area. Uh, because uh, if I remember clearly, it's the first time in the webinar that we talk a detailed uh, description about the uh, education area in the uh, in the, how we teach students to know some financial things. And I think it's very uh, enlightening and give us a lot of ideas of how we can teach students that they can be better uh, uh, make uh, they can be better to save their money, spend their mm -hmm. money, and earn their money. I think it's a very important topic. And then, uh, thank you very much. And then we will turn to Jaya, uh, and uh, Professor Jaya will give us some idea in this topic, and also uh, he will give us his perspective on this area. Okay. And also, he will have he will has PPT to show us his uh, point of view. Welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Yoshini, uh, Shino, and uh, the audience, Hong Yi, uh, Herbert, and uh, Zihu. Uh, I'm very happy to be here and to make comments. These comments were prepared by myself and my colleague, Chris Chetty, who's online as well, uh, but he's on mute, so he won't be able to talk at the stage. But uh, I sent my presentation through, and I will go through this presentation. Uh, basically, it's comments, and uh, you've heard about my background. I'm at Zips currently. Next slide, Yingyi. Can we have the next slide? Yes. So uh, from our findings, we found that uh, we also did a survey in Africa, uh, and we did some questionnaires 
about African countries and how does African countries fare with respect to uh, with respect to, to to fintech and fintech education, and uh, we, we we think that uh, sorry, I'm having a bit. We we think that the fact that Professor Yoshino put it into a quantitative analysis is very good. Uh, and it's, it corroborates some of the results that we found. We interviewed about 100 people, uh, both policymakers and startups in African countries, about nine or 10 African countries. And uh, we found that uh, m much of the uh, findings that came from Professor Yoshino's study, in fact, corroborate some of the findings that we made. Now to comment on the paper that I had seen from Prof Professor Yoshino on financial literacy, uh, we also agree that we cannot assume that uh, financial literacy is an enabler of financial inclusion and FinTech usage. There are several reasons for this because products can be developed and based on preferences and needs. For example, in Africa, some illiterate consumers uh, have a better understanding of, of betting and uh, betting odds. And by the same token, we think that the user should be able to make decisions to save better, but requires products which are based on their need. So it's not just financial literacy, it's sometimes about preferences and about needs. Another example that we found is that an informal worker does not have a regular income and therefore transaction fees for the fintechs and for the banks should be, uh, can, must be able to fit the consumer's lifestyle. So those are some of the uh, points that we, we, we discovered from our study in Africa. And our study was conducted just in Southern and Eastern Africa. Mm. From the consumer's perspective, however, we found that the demand for services and several other key factors inform fintech usage. Uh, for example, the access, if you have info, are informed by internet access and access to the app. If there's no access, then of course, fintech services cannot be uh, achieved. Another factor is affordability. The total cost of usage, including banking fees and internet access costs. Those can be discouraging and can prohibit uh, the access to internet finance and fintech. And adoption, of course, is another important area. Does the product solve a problem experienced by the user? Is the user aware of the product and its offering? And where can the service be used? That is, is the service ubiquitous? Is it everywhere? And that may be provide accessibility to service. But uh, from the FinTech service provider's perspective, the following factors we found inform the usage, the technical and financial and business knowledge. Understanding how FinTech can solve a user's financial problem is important for the FinTech service provider. The service provider also needs access to digital infrastructure. Incubators play an important role here in countries where there were no incubators, we found that the service, uh, technical uh, services were not very adequate. Capital and collateral. Banking licenses need significant investment. In South Africa, for example, you need 250 million rands to get a license. So that is quite expensive. So that can prevent a startup from wanting to take off. And you need knowledge of the local regulatory framework. Uh, foreign and local partnerships can build knowledge and access to key resources. These are some of the important points that we felt uh, uh, came out also of the study from Professor Yoshino. Thank you. Next slide, please. Okay, internet access in South Africa. This, this is what we, we found here that uh, the internet access in South Africa is very limited and that's because of the high levels of poverty and inequality that we have. Uh, and uh, there's a lack of interest. It's, many people have said that there's a lack of interest and there's no need for them. Others have argued that they don't have the skills or the knowledge. 
and they have access to internet elsewhere. And some have argued that the cost of equipment is too high. The cost of subscription is too high. And they have concerns about exposure to in inappropriate or harmful contents. Uh, and some just did not know and some were just unspecified. So those are some of the problems of internet access in South Africa. And South Africa is supposed to have one of the highest in internet uh, 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 countries in Africa at this stage. Next slide, please. So in, in, in Eastern Africa, uh, we found that uh, literacy featured quite high for the reason for people not using the lack of literacy, both financial literacy and literacy of the internet in general. Uh, then there was content, uh, the content was not in local languages. Electricity, shortage of energy and power also played an important role. And of course, some people had sight disabilities. For users who did have access to the internet, affordability of data was an important issue. Affordability of devices and that were not internet enabled. And there was concern over explicit content on the internet as well. And in urban areas, privacy seemed to be a very important issue. And social media impacting on relationships, that was gender and power dynamics also played an important role for in Eastern Africa. Next slide, please. So uh, in Kenya, you will find that the internet access skyrocketed from 2015 onwards, the, there was greater internet access and greater use of the internet. And it moved from virtually uh, a very low percentage, 70% uh, in 2000 to almost, uh, you know, 89% uh, in 2017. So, in, and today Kenya is one of the leading countries that provides internet and FinTech access to this population. Next slide, please. Okay, so what are some of the drivers of financial inclusion? We found that sustainable financial inclusion has two legs. You have a demand side and you have a supply side. For the demand side, you have adoption, education, and affordability and access. And for the supply side, that is for the providers, you have to have uh, for sustainable financial inclusion, local knowledge, regulatory framework, you have to have capital and collateral and technological and business capabilities. So these seem to be the most important factors that drive financial inclusion in Southern and Eastern Africa. Next slide, please. So the financial literacy program uh, question that we sent out came up with some of these uh, results. And as we said, it corroborates some of the uh, uh, quantitative analysis done by Prof Professor Yoshino. We need to improve financial literacy. We need to integrate the financial literacy program into schools and tertiary training. Uh, private, pa uh, public private partnerships need to also deliver on financial literacy programs. We need to also engage community based organization and engage agents. And we found that there's more support for uh, um, uh, electronic payments and financial literacy in East Africa than in other parts of Africa. We have agents have stronger support for mobile money agents in East Africa. And uh, we found the question we ask is how do agents contribute to the promotion of financial literacy? Is there an opportunity for the agents to do more? These are some of the questions that came out of this questionnaire that we sent out and you can see the results in greater detail there. I'm sure you will have access to this uh, presentation. Next slide, please. So uh, some of the factors, that exclusion factors, uh, we ask questions that uh, rank the relevance of these drivers of financial exclusion. And if some of the results are there on your right hand side, on my right hand side, your left hand side, inappropriate products and services, lack of trust in Eastern and Southern Africa showed a very important and significant role. Next slide, please. Based on, uh, yeah, these are based on responses. With the, next slide, please, yes. 
Now, for the issue of mobile wallet transaction fees, uh, we've, we looked at Kenya and you found that the fees structure in Africa is one of the most difficult problems and obstacles. I mean, you, if you look at the table there, you will see that in South Africa, uh, some of the banks' fee structure is, is very high. Whereas in, in places like China and elsewhere, the fee structure is almost non-existent. There's no registration fee, there's no monthly fee, and the withdrawal cost is uh, less than 1% in China. So the, the way in which the fees are organized for mobile payments can be a very difficult uh, uh, obstacle for startups to take off in, in South Africa in particular, but in Southern Africa uh, in general. Next slide, please. So we have a, a limited transaction from high financial access to reduce poverty. And we, you can see that in Southern Africa, there's, uh, uh, there are several other uh, factors that play a role here. Access to credit is weak. Uh, there's corruption and unemployment, high co data costs and products target uh, top of the pyramid rather than the bottom. In our research, in research, we also found that there are products that are inappropriate and large proportion of South Africa's banks are, are grant recipients. That means they receive government uh, grants and, and, and welfare payments. From the banks and uh, the consultancies, etc., they cater mostly for the rich and the middle class. Inequality provide, uh, denies access uh, to those and denies uh, inclusion. The, we also need to reduce red tape for the SMEs. In Eastern Africa, you found that uh, they need support with economic empowerment. There's a lack of literacy in that area, especially uh, successful ideas are not rolled out in scale. And of course, the most important part is the lack of co collateral and high interest rates. I will talk about the challenges next. Can we have the next slide, please? Can we have the next slide? Okay, some of the challenges faced by fintech startups. There's a half high fi failure rate of startup businesses in Africa, and startup requires access to expert knowledge and mentorship. We have a high capital investment threshold to secure a banking license, 250 million rands in uh, South Africa, that's 125 million RMB. Startups lack collateral partnerships with traditional banks inhibit competition and sustain monopolies. Then you have the regulatory issues. The regulatory process can be restrictive. And we, we recommended that if we adopt the Chinese model of looser restrictions, startup businesses will be beneficial in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. And we also f uh, got feedback that sub-Saharan Af African regulators need training as well. Next slide, please. So thank you very much. Uh, that was my comment. Based on that, I took the opportunity to do a quick uh, understanding of how things work in Africa so that you can get a, a better picture. And some of the arguments for financial literacy seem similar to what's happening in Japan, but I think Japan is a more advanced society. And uh, of course, you don't have high levels of poverty and inequality and unemployment and you have greater access to internet and uh, fintech there. Thank you very much to you. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Jaya, to introduce us about the situation in Africa, especially in the area of the internet and the fintech. And then we will welcome Krish, uh, yeah, uh, and to say more about uh, fintech in this area. Is it Krish? Uh, uh, oh. Good afternoon, please. Good afternoon, good afternoon. Welcome. Welcome to join our webinar. Thank you. Um, uh, mm. Dr. Josie has actually gone through most of my comments and I think he's covered a lot of the points. I'll just emphasize a few of the points that, uh, that he raised, uh, speaking to, to what uh, Professor Yoshini uh, had spoken about, um, particularly about the issue of collateral and, and capital. Um, uh, Dr. Josie mentioned the high amount of capital that's required in South Africa, 250 million rands. 125 million RMB. It's very, very difficult for a startup to actually uh, secure that amount of financing early on uh, in their business. And what that actually leads to 
to, to get that banking license is that these startups then need to try and partner with a traditional financial institution, uh, which already has the banking license. And that in its own is then limiting um, competition in, in the sector. Uh, so th there needs to be a way where we can uh, provide access or at least offer or allow startups to get some sort of license, but without such a stringent uh, capital requirement. Um, and then also the point about big data, I think I want to emphasize, yes, it's very difficult for startups to actually be collecting any data when their products out in the market. Um, but uh, more so uh, in, in the African context where many of the, 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 the poor actually don't have access to the internet or are not using uh, products and then are not producing uh, big data. So we don't have an understanding of what their trends or their preferences are because they're, they're not tweeting, they're not actually putting out data into the public. So effectively the poor are not counted. And that's also why the, 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 the services that are provided are targeted to the rich because they are the ones that are actually producing the data right now. Uh, in effect, the, the poor are a black box that are have this unknown quality and the apps have not been produced based on their needs. So when we say um, it's not just about literacy, it's about uh, tailoring the application to the need. It's based on what sort of information do we actually have about the poor so that we can structure an application based on need. So we, we need to be more creative in understanding what the need is and then designing an application so it actually meets that need and solves a problem uh, that people face. In Kenya, the M-Pesa app was very popular, uh, primarily because it started to solve problems that, that people face. To get onto a taxi, you could then pay with an app, but you did so using USS, USSD uh, technology. So without any transaction fees, you could pay for uh, transport. You could go to uh, uh, any shop or anywhere and you could start to pay for services like electricity, uh, and things that, that people need using uh, your phone and not necessarily a smartphone in, in those instances. Uh, you could do so using a feature phone. So uh, those were the innovations that actually pushed uh, uh, Kenya forward in terms of uh, uh, financial inclusion. And in, uh, in developing economies, I think those are the types of ideas that we really need to support. Yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there and I'll see how the rest of the discussion goes. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your additional words. Uh, and then we will turn to Mr. Herbert. Hello, hello? Professor Herbert. Yeah, can yes, you hear me? Hello. Yeah, it's <laughs> yes, your turn. Hello. Yeah, after hearing their uh, uh, description and uh, hearing their uh, words about uh, Japan's uh, uh, phenomena and the uh, Africans' phenomena. So what's your perspective on this area, especially in FinTech area? Hello? Yeah, I can hear have you. Have you put me on? So yes, yes. yes, yes. Yes, yes. It's your turn. Okay. It's your turn to okay. give us the perspective. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, okay. I've not written down anything because I do not have a comparative research to Professor Yoshino nor to Jaya. My modest comments are based on 40 years in central banking. So it's a long term view of central banking. And I just make three key remarks. The first one is the big difference between Japan and South Africa. If you look at Japan, the basic needs of people, what are the basic needs of people? Education, health, and a pension for savings. The government has taken care of that. So there's very little incentive for the people to study the stock market, to study investments. There's very little in incentive because government has taken care of that. In South Africa, it's quite different. There are private schools, private health service, and if you want a good pension, you have to study finance. That was my first point. My second point is people have no idea what FinTech is. You know, we are talking about fintech as everybody agrees. The average person doesn't even understand what e-money is, meaning my e-banking, things which exist already. So what is, what is fintech? Yeah? We've had the example of uh, small and medium enterprises. 
Yeah. And there I want to make a comment on Jaya. The loose restriction in China at the beginning has resulted in a reduction of P2P lending from 7,000 to 700. Yeah, that's a lesson from loose regime for startups, for PMPs, over FinTech. So my point is, let's be quite clear. What is FinTech? What is FinTech special compared to what we have already? E-money, and e-money is provided by banks. And my third point is, the banks are here to stay. Because uh, Professor Yoshino was referring to substituting banks. Many things banks don't do well. Many things are too expensive. But remember, there's one point why we need banks, because they can create money. And if you tell the public, FinTech is creating money, then this is rubbish. You mislead the public. FinTech does not create money. So far, we do not have digital money. We have cryptocurrencies, which are assets. And that's a big scam. Cryptocurrency, uh, digital currencies don't exist yet. There's not one. And once FinTech can create money, we're gonna have supervision. Those were my three points, thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your perspective. And then we'll turn to Dr. Chen Hongyi. So, Are you so ready? Maybe, <laughs> before, uh, maybe uh, Professor could, uh, do you have any response for uh, the comment or the question from uh, Dr. Jaya and uh, Herbert? Hey, thank you very much for two uh, different views and discussions. And I noticed that Africa is very different from Asia and Japan. And I think that even though we are different, but financial education is very important at school. So whatever the level of the financial technology, I think uh, basic needs for the people of education, primary school, secondary school, high school will be needed, whatever the conditions would be. And secondly, uh, Herbert Ponish, uh, very, thank you very much for a uh, very uh, thoughtful comments. Uh, banks are accepting deposits. So they are creating money and broad money, M2. But uh, FinTech was just uh, transferring from one asset to another. However, transaction costs of the FinTech will become much cheaper compared to bank. And then uh, I think many countries in Asia, FinTech is evading into the bank banking business. Banks used, used to make profits for transactions and other services. But those services had been wiped away by other fintech industries. So I think that banks, banking role is very important. However, their profits uh, engine is shrinking. And then the competition may be becoming tougher between the two. However, as you mentioned, banks are the only institutions who can produce uh, cash and deposits. Okay, so that I agree. Thank you very much for both of the comments. Okay, so thank you. Thank you for your response. And Dr. Ho Yi, if you have any questions, uh, you can take the opportunity to ask. If not, okay. I will have questions. <laughs> so you go Next, first. Uh, I, have, I have a quick question. Uh, okay. I want to take this opportunity uh, to ask one uh, quick question uh, from uh, Professor Yoshino, uh, because we know that uh, you were working for Asian uh, Development Bank, Bank Institute, and I think uh, that your presentation uh, highlighted like the financial education uh, in Japan, and uh, also uh, how does it uh, be very important uh, to the Japanese society. So I think maybe that might be also be very interested uh, that uh, would, would you maybe give us like uh, what kind of like the difference uh, because, because Asian Development Bank cover like I think most of uh, the leading economic in uh, Asia. So uh, maybe would you uh, let us know, do you see any like maybe difficulty uh, in uh, if we consider the social context, uh, like any difficulty to apply those financial education system 
in certain country or in certain jurisdiction? Yes, thank you very much. I try to promote financial education in many Asian countries. Right. And I would like to give very interesting example in Thailand. I would say country T. And I try to discuss about financial education. Then first, Central Bank of Thailand, of course, they are very interested in. Then Securities Dealers Association, they are also interested in. And Ministry of Education, they said they are interested in financial education. The Ministry of Finance, uh, they are interested in. Then three years ago, I visited all of them. Then I discussed, how about creating one big conference all together? And three years ago, each government office, including Central Bank, prefers their own conference rather than getting together. So in the first morning, I had a conference at the Central Bank of Thailand. In the afternoon, Ministry and Securities uh, Association. It was not so easy to get everything together. And Japanese success was Central Bank, Financial Services Agency, Consumer Protection Agency, all the agencies and also private financial institutions get together and we need financial education. So I think those kind of consolidated uh, government and private sectors are uh, motivation, motive to make uh, financial education possible. And that will be very important for the nationwide and that will provide a very good momentum for the people. So I think whether the country will get together or not, that is also related to the structure of the central bank ministries and private financial institutions. So th that is my comment. Thank you very much. Right, thank you very much. So that is very important. Uh, before we promote financial education, but we also need to make sure every stakeholder they come into the room and yes, they agree yes. with the idea. Yes. Okay. Thank yeah, thank you. And I I'll, will also ask two questions. Uh, the first question is like that. So we have witnessed a huge impact of fintech on Chinese household behavior these years, especially in the area of consumption. So when combined with the e-commerce, the fintech has brought us more accessibility to funding to support individual and uh, domestic consumption. So it has stimulated the young generation to lever themselves to spend more on things than are traditionally beyond their affordability. That means they may have less money, but they spend more because uh, it's more easier for them to spend money. So, so some young people uh, are now more vulnerable to financial instability. That means uh, uh, it, it's uneven on their spending and, uh, uh, and their income. So how do you look at such a phenomenon? Okay, that's my first question. Is it, does my, is okay, it? Okay, thank clear? you. Okay. Yes, can I answer? Yes, uh, it's, it's your turn. It also happened very similar phenomenon in Thailand. Oh, okay. <laughs> It's the same. Even teacher, teacher at school, teachers at school, mm -hmm. they just need cash card, credit card. And they, many teachers, lady teachers, spend lots of money and before mm -hmm. they receive income. So debt yeah. overhang becoming popular among teachers. So there's a joke, how could those teachers can teach financial literacy to their children? <laughs> so I think that credit card will allow them to spend more before the mm. income comes in. So mm. that is why financial education is very important. How do you see your income, future mm. stream? Then mm. your financial planning is very important. Mm. So I think that is one of the basis. And what is the results of your debt overhang? And sometimes your parents and all your relatives has to help you, or you have to return your money every year, money for so many years. Okay. okay. So financial education, you have to always think about your income and how much you consume and save and so on. That is the basis of the financial education. Okay. 
Okay, thank you. And uh, my second question will be, uh, there are reports that the Chinese National People Congress accelerates the legislation progress on personal bankruptcy law. So due to mm -hmm. the economic boom, nowadays the financial education comes in various forms, but the quality is not guaranteed. So many people mm -hmm. lost their money through inappropriate uh, investment recommended by educational uh, agencies. So do you mm -hmm. think the financial education areas must be regulated or those mm -hmm. agencies or uh, experts must be certif uh, certified? So any mm -hmm. role that you think that government must play in the financial education? That means government uh, publish some rules or laws to regulate the financial education area. Yeah, that's my mm -hmm. second question. Thank you very much. I think many private sectors also have their own financial education. Mm -hmm. However, insurance companies always talking about insurance is very important. Right. Security companies said stock market is important. And okay. each financial industry will mainly talk about their own products. Mm -hmm. So if you allow just private sectors to do their financial education, then that, that those are uh, distorted, diversified, uh, financial education. So I think the load of government is very important. However, each products and each financial activities, those are specialized by bankers, insurance companies, security areas, and so on. So I think the overall picture should be created by central bank and financial service agencies by the government. However, each component of those financial education should come from private sector. But we're balanced and overview are important. So I think that collaboration with government, public sector, and private sectors are very important, including Ministry of Education. Without the consent of Ministry of Education, we cannot put our contents into the textbook. So in Japan, we had a hard time to convince Ministry of Education to put our financial education into the, each section. I see. Okay. Okay. Yes, thank you very much for your enlightening answer. And before ending today's webinar, uh, I would like to ask any guests if you have any questions to add, if you, add, you want to say anything about, uh, about today's webinar. If not, we will, uh, you can raise your hand or just speak right. uh, if yeah, not however, we'll... yeah however would you like to say something i think even your experience uh, working for bis i think that will be really beneficial to have uh, your perspective on lots of topics uh, maybe you can elaborate a little bit more for us okay well look basically i am on the same line as professor yoshino after being in 40 years in central banking, we stress the role of the government. It's a bit of uh, uh, pampering. You know, I'm the daddy, I know better. But if you leave the private sector, like uh, Hu Jie said, young people get themselves into over indebtedness. If you leave it all to the private sector, they sell their interest. Whereas we, meaning the regulators, we are responsible for financial stability. And to give you just one example, the P2P platforms. Small and medium enterprises, the point well taken from Professor Yoshino and Jaya, not well served. But I'm not sure that allowing 7,000 platforms to open, to run away with the money, and then the solid 10% are left. So people have, be, have to be told how risky stuff is. And the same thing for cryptocurrency. You have to be quite clear, it's a scam. And this is the role of the public sector. Thank you. Okay. okay. I've got a comment if I can. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. What, what we're also finding in Africa is that many of the services that could be offered more formally so through the fintechs are being done informally. Uh, in particular, I mean, there's a desperate need for us to formalize savings. 
but across the continent you have a culture of informal savings which uh, can also be quite risky when there are not uh, proper structures in place um, so you have little communities come together where they pool their funds and then, and then try to save it somewhere but uh, the controls over that money is then not very well established. So fintechs do solve problems. Uh, there are gaps in the markets that, that can be solved, but uh, the, it's the struggle right now for the, these new startups to actually gain access to the market and then compete um, uh, with the traditional banks who then monopolize the sector right now. So um, there's, there's lots of opportunities. It's just, it's how do we structure this correctly? And how do we ensure that the, the right regulations are placed so that the, the level of risk um, is counted with an appropriate set of, uh, of regulations? Thanks. Okay, thank you. So, Chaya, do you, Professor Chaya, do you have anything to add? Yes, Chaya, maybe you need to unmute your microphone and we can hear you. Yeah, no, I think uh, I'm fine. I think uh, all of the people have covered. I agree with uh, uh, the issue of regulations and I agree with Herbert's position that until cryptocurrencies become uh, re real money, that they're not going to serve much purpose. And I think, yes, we need to have strong regulations, otherwise, we will have the same crisis of peer-to-peer -peer lending that we had in China. So we, and in, in Africa, we are trying to find a way in which we can have a standard and a, a continental standard for internet finance so that all countries have similar approaches uh, to do this because this, we are moving now to a free trade area in Africa and you will find that there'll be more and more need for internet finance and FinTech rather than traditional banking. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for all the distinguished guests. And thank you again for uh, Professor Yoshino, your perfect presentation. And before ending today's webinar, we will uh, invite Dr. Chen Hongyi again to forecast next week's, uh, next week's webinar for all of us, especially the audience online. So Dr. Chen Hongyi. Okay, thank you, Hu Jie, and uh, thank you very much again, once again, for Professor Yoshino and uh, Jaya Herbert, uh, your contribution to our webinar today. Uh, as far as I check uh, the statistic uh, sent from our uh, media partner, uh, today we have almost like 10,000 audience. So thank you very much for uh, your input and uh, to produce some of the online content. Uh, for everyone, I think during the time of crisis, coronavirus. So I think thank you very much for today, your, all of your contribution. So next week, uh, next Wednesday, uh, we have pleasure to invite uh, Michelle Rose from Cambridge Center for Alternative Finance, uh, Judge Business School at the University of Cambridge to present the topic, the Facebook Libra past, present and the future. So the time is next Wednesday, uh, 10th June at uh, 6 p.m. Beijing time, uh, which is 11 a.m. Uh, European time. So I hope for those uh, following us today, uh, we will very much like to see you again next week. Okay, thank you. We are looking forward to next week's webinar. And thank you again for every guest joining us today. Thank you for the audience online. So see. See you next week. Bye bye. <laughs> okay, bye bye. Thank bye -bye. you very much, Professor Yoshino. Thank you very Herbert. much. Thank you for your contribution. Bye bye. Yeah, bye. have a nice day. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.